Before we begin, I am very excited to have Babbel sponsoring this video. I love languages, and I actually studied Spanish in college before spending some time visiting parts of rural Mexico. It was an amazing experience that I'll never forget. That was over 10 years ago, and since then I haven't spoken a single sentence of Spanish. Babbel is an excellent tool to help me brush up on my dormant language skills. The lessons are designed by real language teachers using real-world practical conversations to help you learn. The layout of the lessons are fun, simple, and easy to use on different devices. So if you're like me and you're interested in refreshing your old language skills, or even if you've never learned a language before but maybe want to in order to learn something new, travel somewhere, or simply better yourself, then Babbel is an amazing tool to help you do just that. By clicking the link in the description right now, you can get 65% off your subscription to Babbel, along with a 20-day money-back guarantee. Gracias, Babbel, por patrocinando este video. I'll let you advanced Spanish speakers critique that in the comments. On September 24th of 2010, 39-year-old Todd Hofflander traveled with his friend Jeff Wee to the Seven Devils Wilderness in Idaho to scout the area for the upcoming deer season. Todd brought his black lab Ruby along with him. Both men would end up camping in the area over the weekend and walking between Sheep Creek Basin and McGaffey Basin during their scouting. On the morning of the 27th, the two were above the area known as McGaffey Cow Camp when Todd started to complain of pain in his knees due to all the hiking he had been doing. They then decided they would separate. Todd and his dog would take the easier trail down to the Snake River and McGaffey Cabin, while Jeff would continue towards Sheep Creek and then down to the river. The original plan was for Todd to wait at McGaffey Cabin while Jeff would get a boat and then head down the Snake River to pick Todd up. Jeff walked north along the ridges until he eventually dropped into Sheep's Creek and then arrived at the junction of Sheep Creek and the Snake River. He then flagged down a passing jet boat and got a ride to Pittsburgh Landing. Here Jeff met up with his father Steve and the two began traveling down the river using Steve's jet boat. They would make it to the McGaffey cabin later that afternoon. Todd was nowhere to be found. The two walked up the trail from the cabin in an attempt to locate Todd, but they had no luck. They made it roughly three miles up the trail until darkness fell, which prevented them from going any further. They both returned to McGaffey cabin and spent the night there. On the morning of September 28th, Jeff and Steve used their boat to search the area between McGaffey Cabin and Sheep Creek, scanning the shoreline in the event that Todd came out one of the other drainages that empty out into the Snake River. They continued in their search until noon when they decided to return to Riggins and contact the sheriff's office for additional assistance. The sheriff initiated a search and rescue operation that same afternoon. The search began using a helicopter to scout the creeks and drainages that Todd was suspected to be found at. Three additional search teams with horses and mules were also organized and responded to the area of the Windy Saddle for deployment at first light the following day. The U.S. Air Force was also contacted to fly over the area using FLIR. Notes from the first day of the search reference how very rugged the Seven Devils Wilderness is with elevations ranging from 1,275 feet at the Snake River to 7,600 feet at the trailhead at Windy Saddle. The terrain is described as very steep, with some cliffs that front the river with as much as 1,800 feet in drop. Vegetation ranges from thick brush and heavy canopy at the river level to steep, rocky ledges at the higher elevations. The temperatures at the time were very moderate for that time of the year, with lows in the 50s at night and highs in the mid-80s during the middle of the day. There are numerous hiking trails in the area, but there was low traffic at that time of the year between the end of summer and the beginning of deer season. On the morning of the 29th, search teams started their initial search from the trailhead at Windy Saddle and headed towards the McGaffey Basin. 
The area from McGaffey Basin to Sheep Creek was also covered using FLIR. A dog team arrived that afternoon and began searching using scent articles from Todd. The dog team would search into the night with the assistance of a handheld thermo imaging device. Todd's companion, Steve and Jeff, continued to search the river using their boat during this time. All search teams found no evidence of Todd. On October 6th, Sheriff's deputies spoke with a man named Tom Lindsay. How Mr. Lindsay was involved in the search or made contact with the Sheriff's office is unclear, but he claimed that dowsing rods had told him that Todd was near Bernard Creek. This creek runs parallel to the trail that Todd was supposed to be on. Mr. Lindsay said that looking up Bernard Creek from the Snake River, Todd would be in the first draw on the right. He also said Todd was alive. Deputies do not appear to have taken this lead very seriously. On October 8th, the sheriff's office received a call from someone saying they had found a dog carcass floating in the Snake River the previous Saturday. The dog had been skinned. The man had taken pictures, but it was uncertain if this dog was Ruby. On October 9th, deputies interviewed Jeff at the Riggins Sheriff's Office prior to administering a polygraph test. The purpose of the interview was to establish the timeline of what had occurred in the days prior to Todd's disappearance. Jeff had taken pictures during the scouting trip and had photographic evidence that Todd was alive and well in the days leading up to his disappearance. After the interview, Jeff was taken to perform the polygraph. During this time, Jeff's father Steve contacted deputies. He was angry that his son was being accused of possibly being involved in a homicide after spending all week searching for Todd. After the polygraph, deputies and the examiner sat down with Jeff to discuss the results. Apparently, he had failed the exam and deception was indicated. Jeff was questioned about what he was not telling authorities that was affecting the test. Jeff insisted he was telling the truth and insinuated that the machine must not work. He also stated that pictures on his camera would confirm his story. During questioning, authorities gleaned some new facts from Jeff, like that Todd was carrying a 44 Magnum revolver in a shoulder holster. The revolver was custom and belonged to Todd's deceased father who had formerly worked for California Highway Patrol. Jeff said that Todd had the gun when they separated and insisted he did not cover up Todd's death and did not kill Todd intentionally or otherwise. During the interview, Jeff's father abruptly entered the room and insisted that Jeff leave, thus ending the interview. On October 13th, authorities conducted a long interview with Todd's wife, Julie. This interview supplied many details about Todd's life, but few things that seem relevant to his disappearance. Some of the more interesting statements revolve around Todd's relationship with Steve and Jeff. For example, Julie stated that Todd would get his feelings hurt by Steve and Jeff periodically, when they would ask him to go on a fishing trip, then cancel or change the date. They would then call Todd unexpectedly and say, guess where we are, and describe the trip that they were on. Julie claimed that Jeff would occasionally look at her in a way that made her feel uncomfortable, and that he looked at dogs as tools and periodically beat his dog. These claims, if true, do not paint a good picture of Jeff's character. On October 15th, some hikers that were driving along Seven Devils Road had stopped for lunch in a parking area near mile marker 15. While eating, they noticed a black lab come down a hill and begin pacing, whining, and growling. Being aware that Todd was currently missing, and that he had a black lab with him, the hikers attempted to coax the dog over using food. They noticed the dog would get excited when they mentioned the name Ruby or Todd. The hikers believed there was a good chance that they had indeed discovered Todd's dog. They spent a while calling Todd's name and looking around, but with no result. Afterwards, they contacted the sheriff's office and alerted them to the find. The hikers then drove the dog into Riggins to meet up with deputies. The black lab would be inspected by sheriff's deputies who noticed the dog looked very healthy in appearance and did not look starved. 
It had a very shiny coat and no noticeable cuts or abrasions. The dog was not wearing any collar or pack when found, which was unusual because when Todd and Ruby went missing, Ruby was wearing a collar and blue doggy pack. Julie Hofflander had been called and was waiting nearby with her two children in order to identify the dog. Deputies brought the dog nearby and the family began calling Ruby's name and the dog ran straight to them. Julie confirmed the lab was indeed Ruby, alive and well. Search teams took Ruby back to the area she was found the next day in an attempt to get her to lead them to Todd, but they were unsuccessful. On October 19th, deputies met with Todd's wife Julie and explained where Ruby had been found and plans for possible searching in the next two days to cover this area. Julie asked deputies to talk to a psychic detective from California whom she had paid $500 for information. Deputies then talked to this psychic detective who told them that Todd had a great deal of inner anger and owed a great debt. She said that Jeff had mistakenly shot and killed Todd while hunting, and Jeff buried Todd. She stated that she doused a map of the area, and determined the burial site as the area around the Indian Trail Ridge. Searching continued off and on for 18 days total. During that time, searchers covered nearly every area they could within the vicinity of where Todd disappeared. There were days where up to seven dog teams were searching at the exact same time, with some teams continuing on until the dogs could no longer walk. With searchers exhausted and seemingly out of options, the search was terminated on October 21st. At that time, there were no clues that had been found which might indicate where Todd might be. The only possible clue even tied to Todd was the discovery of his dog on October 15th. The area where the dog was found had been searched with men, dog teams, and covered numerous times by airplane. The entire search was well publicized with many hunters lending assistance. With increasingly bad weather looming over the search operation, the sheriff's office had little choice but to give up. Nearly 10 years would pass before any new updates occurred with Todd's case. On April 27th of 2020, a hunter in the Bernard Creek area found what appeared to be human remains, along with backpacking supplies and a camera. The hunter took the camera and brought it back to the Idaho County Sheriff's Office for analysis. The sheriff discovered pictures of Todd on the camera's SD drive. A team of deputies was then taken to the area by boat in order to collect the remains. The bones and gear were discovered roughly 200 feet and on the opposite side of Bernard Creek from the trail that Todd had been traveling on. Deputies noticed that the pack and assorted items matched the description of those that Todd was known to be carrying. Only a partial skeleton was discovered, including pieces of cranium, ribs, scapula, and part of a humerus. The area is thick with brush and not a good spot to camp or be seen by helicopters in the air. Video and photographs taken by Idaho County Sheriff's deputies do a good job of showing the location and condition of the items found. Deputies fanned out in all directions, searching for any additional clues, but found nothing. Noticeably absent from the location were Todd's boots and firearm. Both of these items are extremely unlikely to have decayed away completely during the prior 10 years. Pictures were recovered from the camera's SD card, but none were of Todd on the hunting trip because the card had already been full prior to his leaving. The assorted items were shown to Todd's wife, who also confirmed that they were his. The coroner would eventually confirm the remains to be Todd by using comparison DNA analysis on the bone fragments that were found. I was unable to find an official ruling as to the cause of death in this case, but in all likelihood it would be undetermined due to a lack of evidence. The exact cause for the disappearance and death of Todd Hofflander has, and perhaps always will be, a complete mystery. The case is notable in the sense that there are clues that point in a number of different directions. As with other cases involving hunters, Aaron Hedges being a good example, 
What we know about the movements of Todd prior to his disappearance are dependent on the narrative of his hunting companion, Jeff. While Jeff did assist with the search for Todd, it is easy to see why deputies found him to be untrustworthy. Despite being Todd's friend, the relationship that Julie described does not sound much like friendship. Jeff's polygraph test failure could also be seen as suspicious, depending on whether or not you put much stock in such tests. The search for Todd Hofflander appears to have been quite extensive. Search logs confirm that Bernard Creek was flown over using a helicopter, but the canopy would have prevented Todd from being seen if he was there. FLIR technology should have also had a good possibility of seeing him, as long as he was still alive and warm for the FLIR to detect. Ground search maps do show parts of Bernard Creek being covered, but not in the specific area where Todd was found. With so many dog teams on the ground, it does seem pretty surprising that they did not find him. Search dogs are not always successful. Not all dogs are created equal, and neither are their handlers. But many different teams were involved with this search, and none picked up on Todd's location. At least a few of these dog teams were trained to pick up on both live and dead scents, so the issue of whether he was alive or not at the time does not seem to be a big factor. Oftentimes, viewers seem interested in the psychic predictions made during a missing persons case, so let's take a look at the two we have in this one. The psychic detective that Todd's wife Julie hired said that Todd was accidentally killed and buried in the area of Indian Trail Ridge. This location is not near the location where Todd was actually found. The other man, who is not specifically called a psychic, but is mentioned having used dowsing rods, told deputies that looking up Bernard Creek from the Snake River, Todd would be in the first draw to the right, in section PB38. He also said Todd was alive. As odd as it may seem, if you were to look up Bernard Creek from the Snake River, the first draw that heads to the right is very close to where Todd was actually found. And technically, his remains were found at the very bottom of section 21, but practically right on the line with section PB38. I suppose a believer could say that since the dowser said Todd was alive, he could have moved down the creek a bit more before perishing. I leave it to you all to decide if this prediction was simply luck or something more. Either way, it is very unfortunate that the sheriff's office did not check out this lead. I did not see a report that indicated it was ever acted upon. The location where Todd's remains were found only deepens the mystery. Why was he 200 feet off the trail and across Bernard Creek? Did Todd's bad knee get worse and force him to make camp and he chose to do so next to a water source? If he was still alive when the search began a day later, then why did he never return to the trail or hear the search parties looking for him? His clothing and gear were in relatively good condition even after being found 10 years later. These articles of clothing show no signs of animal attack, so predation can be ruled out. Todd's holster was discovered among his things, but what happened to his revolver? The only two items that came up missing were the revolver and Todd's boots. What happened to these things? I tried to get in contact with one of the detectives involved with this case to get his opinion on some of the odd aspects. Unfortunately, I was met with silence. I know many will turn to the possibility of foul play in this case, and that is certainly a valid theory. I know others will turn to more paranormal possibilities. Those can't necessarily be discounted either. It took 10 years to find Todd, and while this likely gave his family some semblance of closure, it still left a lingering mystery. Like a number of other cases, this one simply offers more questions than it does answers. Sometimes, that is simply the nature of a missing persons case. Until next time, thanks for watching.